do. And so I moved that we change 9B, Lime Emer Scooter, to the staff uh, to become, oh, let's put it after public participation. And that will uh, get it done, ensure we get it done. We To pass this, we just need a majority vote of the board to move to change the agenda order. I'll move that we change it. Sure. All right, it's done. So moved. Great. So yeah, now we'll make sure we get that done so we don't let it slop off the back end of tonight. Uh, but uh, Lisa, would you like to start us? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome to the Downtown Management Commission meeting. It is Tuesday, September. 12th, and I will call roll. Susan Newsom. Here. Don Poe. Here. Stephanie Trees. Here. And Justin Calvin will not be attending. And I will turn the meeting over to our chair for procedural items. Great. Well, uh, I move we approve the minutes from our last meeting on July 11th. Do we have a second? Second. Prove they are. Uh, next, uh, we have our elections. And so Justin's not here. He's in trouble. Um, ha -ha. How you get elected. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, Susan, you're, you're, you're about to, when does your term expire? I think my last meeting is in March of next year. Great. Right, usually well, right, yeah. Yeah. 2024, well, I know. I'm, well, A, I apologize, I can't be there. My uh, wife is also on a city board and they've right. moved her meetings from th for Thursday to Tuesday. So uh, it makes childcare issues challenging for me. But um, I, uh, Stephanie, I I, yes. I think, you know, addressing you, uh, do you have interest in being the chair? I do not. I would like to remain vice chair. <laughs> That's okay. I think you're doing a great job, Don, and my capacity is a little limited currently, or it seems to be. So, well, I Unless, feel yes. bad. You know, so, Su Susan, I assume you don't want to be chair. What with you going off the board at some point? No, I don't think that makes sense. So. so I would maybe move that we table this till the next session when Justin is here so we can get his input. Otherwise, I will volunteer to be chair again, but I, I like the idea of passing it around. But if I don't want to saddle Justin with it, if he's not into it. And we have no indication that he is or is not. Has anyone talked to him? He did not indicate either way. Okay, should be. All right, well, that sounds appropriate. Great. So let's table elections till our next meeting yet again. Thank you, Stephanie, for the vote of confidence. <laughs> um, so moving on to the next item of public participation. Uh, I believe Reagan's part of the city. So is there any public here? I mean, yeah, we can look over, and if anybody wants to speak from the public, I'm not seeing any it's just staff, so we should be good to go. Great. So moving on to the next uh, agenda item, which is now uh, Lime e-scooter expansion letter to the staff. Um, to make sure that we're doing this properly, uh, I wrote this up, and... Um, there was a couple of things that came to light uh, after our last meeting. One of them is that this isn't going to city council, that Chris Haglin is uh, kind of the, the one deciding this and it kind of moved ahead faster than we all thought and kind of was in, in a way in, indicated after our last meeting. So to a degree, this is, oh, I don't know if it's moot. I think it's always worth raising your hand, but does anyone have any comments on that letter to be sent to, Chris and to city council. Mm 
It and just a point of clarification, the intent would be to send it to Chris, and when he does his next information item, it will be added to the end of the packet. So that's the comment. Okay. Do, do we give it a chance for Chris to reply? Or does that is that not useful? He certainly could. Yeah. yeah that's okay. Why wouldn't, but. Okay. I mean to say that like it would be ideal if we if we did reach some alignment prior to taking it to council, but if you think it's better as just like a packet, that's what I was curious about. Between Chris and us, like that conversation. Sure. If that's the preference of the I don't know. We can just send it directly to Chris and see if what if he responds and then maybe it's Maybe it's a new point. Or maybe adapt it or something. You know, what do you think about that, Don? I am open to all ways. Uh, just after the Friday night buff parade thing, there was a, uh, you know how like when motorcycles are in a gang and they kind of like are down the highway and they can't, you, they become one organism and you can't like get around them. It was kind of like that of Lime Scooters where like, there was a whole pass all of them going by uh, down Canyon on the sidewalk. And like, we just had to wait for like all of them. No, no, it was Walnut uh, for them all to pass by. And so, um, you know, they're already there uh, and stuff. So we have different opinions. My opinion is maybe stronger than others. Uh, and I temper this as our group. Um, I am game to just send it to Chris. Chris Jones here just said we would, you know, it would be added to Chris Haglund's packet. And I don't know what that is. Part of me says, this is a big deal to the DM. If this is a big deal to the DMC, we could send it to Chris Haglund and we could send it to council. I, I don't know why we wouldn't do that. Uh, and when, when Chris Jones, you said we would just add it to Chris Haglund's packet. I don't know what that packet is. So I guess so, I need more clarification. Yeah, Chris Transportation and mobility. So let's maybe remove yeah. the names out of it. Transportation and mobility is leading this work. Um, council empowered them uh, to implement. And in that, though, they did uh, uh, seek input from a variety of stakeholders, including the Downtown Management Commission. Um, they have since worked with Lab Spheres to implement um, all over the city, west of 28th Street. And um, in many cases, did uh, uh, make changes to the locations of slow zones and and some of the other uh, capabilities that line scooters have, um, but it seems that maybe there are some requests that, uh, from the, the DNC meetings that were not uh, uh, met. So we can certainly communicate directly with transportation mobility and see if they have a formal response to why or why not, you know, they, they've not made the changes that, that may have been requested by this particular stakeholder group, um, and then go from there. Transportation mobility does need to provide counsel at some point, I'm not sure when it's on the calendar for an, an information item to update counsel on how the program is going now that it's been expanded. Um, in that, they would certainly include, um, uh, and they can include feedback they, they re received from various stakeholders, including DMC, so the council would have the full spectrum of perspective on um, uh, what's going on and concerns that folks might have. Again, it doesn't mean that uh, it will lead to changes or that, that you know, when it comes down to it, well, it's a downtown management commission. Um, there are a lot of players involved in what happens in the public right of way. And um, while we, you all are an advisory board for, for all things downtown and you're a stop along the way, um, they might have really good reasons about why um, the requests that were made at the meeting weren't, uh, weren't put into place. Maybe the one follow-up question I have to that, Chris, is The timing of transportation mobility reporting to council was indeterminate. I heard it's like someday in the future. And I guess I just don't want this to it 
we don't need council to weigh in on it, but I also don't want this. Can we set some expectation or how could we say, hey, transportation mobility, we would like an answer within this time or I, I, I guess I just don't want things to always move at the speed of government, you know? <laughs> so, well, I, I don't want to necessarily volunteer uh, our friends with transportation mobility to have a response to you within the next 30 days. I don't know that that would be a problem. So if we direct the communication to Chris, I imagine that we could um, get a response emailed to you all, um, uh, certainly within the next month. And if that's not the case, we can let you know. That works for me. If yeah, that sounds fair to me. I think we'll, this will probably be on our agenda next time anyway, sort of a how do we think it's going. So the further the process, I think it makes sense to, to do that. Send the message to Chris. Sounds good. Says. Stephanie, sound good to you? It does, yeah. I mean... From what I was, from, did I read that there's a one year contract with Lime? Or, yeah, that's not very long, and especially in government time. So, I imagine they're going to be like getting feedback in general and like assessing how it's going. And we're going to be an input into like the scooters are just laid everywhere, like they all are in Denver and everywhere, like, or not. Maybe the fault, maybe it's only a couple of people or just during CU events or something. So I, I do think it's a little early to tell the scope of what isn't working. And so I don't think time will hurt us, frankly. I think it might help to kind of gather more information. So keep your eyes out. And I agree with this plan. Yeah. Well, then I move that uh, we direct this be sent to transportation mobility. Do we send it, Chris, or do you facilitate that in some manner? We staff can facilitate. And just as a point of order, the chair typically shouldn't make motions. You should leave it up to your other commissioners to make the motions and you get to take the vote. Awesome. So does anyone move that we pass this? Sure, I'll move that we <laughs> send have staff send the memo to transportation. Okay. And do we have a second, Stephanie? Second, yeah. Great. Well, thank you did for that. Terry, did Terry have a question? I saw your hand was up earlier. Okay. Cool. Do we, uh, maybe I just need to, re well, it's maybe too late now. Do we need to put that timeline thing in there, Chris? Or can we just kind of assume that's what's gonna happen? Um, or you can just talk to him about that. Yes. It'll be reflected in the minutes, and yeah, we do not need to have a formal motion. Um, as long as the commission approves of the language um, as a body, then we'll we'll make sure that that's reflected in our um, message to, to press transportation mobility. Great, speeding right along. Consent agenda uh, topics will not be discussed unless uh, there is a question to the commission from the commission. And so, did anyone have any uh, questions? This includes the Affordable Commercial Development Program. Uh, I guess this is in the last consent agenda. A topic, but it might be out of order is I was reading about the homeless day center and then saw like rumors in the camera that the location or there's some questions about it. So yeah, that's early, but it sounds like it's very thin in its last minutes. So, and I noticed it wasn't in this consent. So I was curious of the thread. It can be later discussed. But. I think that because the uh, we have a public safety update coming up very soon in our agenda, I think that can we put it to, that question to then, uh, Stephanie? That seems good, Chris. Sure, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Fredford might be able to speak to what's going on with the day center, but I mm -hmm. want to acknowledge that at a previous meeting, yes, we did have Housing and Human Services here to talk about that. I know there have been changes since the last time we heard from them, and so. 
if the deputy chief isn't able to answer questions, we can certainly reach out to Housing and Human Services and see if they want to provide a written update or a future report. Okay, that would be great. I don't think I have any questions. I had one question because this happened since our last meeting uh, on page 15 of the agenda under affordable commercial de program development on August 10th staff went to council on a study session for an update on the affordable commercial pilot program and since that's potentially part of the uh, properties that the DMC oversees I could we have do you know what that update was could we have that sent out to us tomorrow so we could see what that update was. So I can, I can speak to that, Commissioner. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to send you the memo from the study session and then the study session summary as well. Council offered significant support for our plans to, or our recommendations rather, to develop an affordable commercial pilot program. Um, this work will really kick off in 2024. And it's, it's, mostly separate from the existing properties within CAGIT, although there, there may be some overlap, but this is really speaking to a formalized affordable commercial program for the city. Is it downtown or where is it? It, it would be citywide. So that said, uh, a significant portion of the resources are coming from CAGIT. So uh, we have a lot of components to our affordable proposed affordable commercial program. Um, the application that we are exploring would it could include leasing a space in the downtown area and holding a master lease on a space that, that is broken up into smaller spaces. That's one path that we are um, considering in the development of this pilot program. And so that element of it certainly would be downtown. But with that, we have affordable commercial covenants that um, exist with properties at 30th and Pearl, at the Macy's redevelopment. Um, and so we'll be, we're wanting to also formalize some of those components. So while it's a citywide program, there certainly will be uh, investment components that occur in the downtown within Cajun because Cajun resources are a part of this. Can I ask a, some quick questions about the consent agenda? Actually, now that I found it, <laughs> um, do you know regarding the University Hill Improvement District um, when the hotel is going to be finished or conference center? Is there a timeline for that? It's always uh, well, moving in my head, and there's the two yeah. the Hill Hotel um, project, and maybe Regan, you might have some fresher memory, but that should be done um, early, early next year. Okay. And then the conference center, I understand, um, should be completed by 2025. Okay. Spring. Regan, did I get that about right? Maybe double that. That's right, Chris. <laughs> Construction. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and the other thing I was curious, um, the three the public, oh wait, there's a new name, Boulder Social Street, sorry. Um, do you think, that we will be able to get an update in one of our standing meetings on that? Which one do you think that will be on how that went? Because I know um, they're gonna assess that and... Sure, we can approach the project manager um, from, uh, uh, I think they're a new project. So we had a retirement. Yeah. Um, so in, in uh, East to be full of workers, business services, that's what we call them now. Anyhow, um, we can invite the project manager to a future meeting um, yeah. if they feel like that's been. Once they've like filed the <laughs> results. Yeah, so in your, included in your packet was actually um, an information item that's been prepared for council. So how about if you didn't have a chance to review that, let us know if, if you have additional yeah. questions. I did review that. Okay. It said something like, we'll give an update towards the end of the year on how it went, like the data from it. So I was hoping we could add that. To yeah, there will be additional. Sure, okay. absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, by then, our next meeting, all of the activities will have, have happened already. So I think that, right. so the November meeting, are we having a November meeting? Yeah, that, we will. that one, maybe if it's ready, that would be a great topic. 
And Lane chimed in with the name of the new project manager, Ben Manabog. Yes. I went to the social streets on, well, first to finish these um, affordable commercial stuff, I'd love for us to have uh, the updates on that as well as it impacts the downtown management area. I think that's really fascinating and it fits in with our priorities pretty well. I went to the social streets on Friday. Uh, I was somehow, you know, because I pay attention to all these city things, I got the emails, I got some free ice cream, my kid got a free icy pop thing, and there was a lot of cheerleaders, but not a lot of public. So uh, I hope uh, more, more people get to some of these things because the actual Pearl Street was packed. Uh, the 13th, I just don't know if people just didn't know about it or what, but it was that one was sparsely attended, I generally say. So consent agenda, moving on, since there's no more questions from that fund financials. The fund will not be discussed unless there are questions posed by the commission. Please reference the packet attachment. And that was on uh, page 17-ish. Uh, I had one question. The transfers in and out, I just, that's a term that I'm familiar with. And I saw that the transfers in have not hit yet. Uh, nor have they cost allocation and transfers out hit. Uh, can you just describe again what those are for me? I just forget what that is. Sure. Hi, I'm over over here. In Toronto, so yep. we, good to see everybody again. Uh, Smart World Budget Officer. Uh, those uh, tend to hit at the end of the year. Uh, so there's a couple different transfers uh, that affect uh, the age of the fund. Um, cost allocation is essentially the uh, administrative overhead costs, all the internal services that are provided uh, by the general fund. So all of the, the dedicated funds, including uh, our general improvement district, pay the cost allocation. So that comes out in one lump sum um, at the end of the year. Uh, and then same thing with the transfers. Um, so there's a transfer from general fund to uh, to Cajun, um, and again, that'll and in the big picture, did you see any red flags or anything that you would want to be like, hey, I noticed this, here's kind of something that's worth noting from your point of view? Not from mine, no, this is Teresa. I think we're tracking that pretty well right now. And one thing that I'll just note is we are going to see a little bit of a difference in the way that our parking revenue comes in for Q4. And because we're transitioning to our gala system, so we're going from a quarterly payment to a monthly payment, so that revenue will come in a little bit differently than it happened in the past. The fun, uh, Stephanie, Susan, anything else, or should we move on to the next step? Did you have any thoughts on the budgetary aspects? Um, any, the capital improvement program, we haven't spent much of that. Is that a timing thing as well? A lot of it is. Yeah. Okay. So you don't see any major changes to that happening. So I think that there's a likelihood that we probably won't spend the full budgeted amount. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that will have to roll into next year, but we are doing an incredible amount of work this year, which I'm really pleased with. And yeah. so we will see some more of that expense come in as we get closer to the end of the year. Okay. One question about personnel is the difference between the year to date and the budget related to still a, a lot of open positions that we plan to fill, or is that something else? Or partly that, and then partly with our transition from the workday system, um, there's an actual journal entry process that has to happen. And so when revenue or when the expenses are booked in our financial system, Munis they haven't always caught up with this cube document that is reporting here. So there's like basically expense reported in the financial system that hasn't caught up. That makes sense. It's like, like three months behind. I'm trying to do the math of adding that up. Yeah. So it looks like it looks like it's half the amount. So there's there's a chunk that will come in, and that's something that we're working through just citywide to get those journals recorded in a timely manner so that it catches up. So from November once it should go up. 
Great, if we're done with fund financials, is that Officer Redfern I can see there? Hey, how are you? Good seeing you again. Thanks Good for course. joining us again. Yeah, my pleasure. Is it my turn? It is your turn. Public safety right. update. Great. So I'm not sure if I met everybody, so I'll reintroduce myself. Steve Redfern, Deputy Police Chief. Um, just uh, here to see if you have questions. I'll just give you kind of a little bit of an update on some of the broader topics that we've been dealing with that specifically impact downtown. Um, it's been busy. It's been uh, it's been really busy. And uh, um, so far, we're uh, keeping up with football. It's been uh, the first couple of weekends have been busy, but actually for us, um, minus a couple of one-offs like the guy burglarizing up on the hill, um, overall, uh, it's been it's been really good. Um, but I'll talk about just a little bit of our internal uh, state of affairs right now. We're uh, down about 15 officers. Uh, we were getting really close to being fully staffed, and then we had a push of people that left to go work uh, for other departments for various reasons. Um, so we're about 175. Uh, we're hiring left and right to get back to 190. Uh, we've got 17 uh, officers that have about a month and a half left in our field training program. And so once those 17 hit the street, we'll have uh, the ability to look at where our staffing needs are and add additional positions back to some of the positions like the mall team, which we initially, the last couple of years, have had to pull people from to put back on the street to make sure we can handle 911 calls. And so we're really excited, assuming we can kind of slow the departures. Um, we want to supplement some of the teams we've had to pull down and the priorities on that are the, the mall team, the hill team, and our encampment team. And so um, those are going to kind of be the priorities to put some staffing in. If that all works out well, uh, you'll see more officers in the area, which is our goal. Um, if you're not familiar uh, with what's been going on with us, we had a meeting, a council meeting Thursday night where our reimagined policing plan was unanimously approved by council, which was exciting for us. Um, it uh, really has been a two and a half, almost three year project. And, and for us, what's exciting in there is not only knowing that council agrees with, with our goals for the next few years, but uh, um, it allows us to be able to implement those goals um, once and if we are able to get back to where we're fully staffed, we there's a good likelihood um, that we can seek additional positions, full-time uh, employment positions based on some of the needs in that plan. And so that's obviously not to put the cart before the horse, but there's potential there that we can uh, maybe even bring up more officers that will allow us to even further work on our problem-solving efforts and crime prevention, all of those things. Um, we've got a lot of great ideas and things we'd love to do teams we'd love to bring back that got taken down after 2020, like our DUI unit and some others. Um, we are, we have our first canine uh, that we brought on uh, through all, through donations through our police foundation. She's uh, a rock star and she is uh, very close to being certified for explosive detection and she'll start working at some of the events and games. That's a, she's a great PR tool as well because she's a very friendly, really cool dog. So that's okay. exciting. We love, uh, she's half a German short hair pointer, half lab. So she's, uh, in fact, I think we just posted a couple of videos on social media in the last couple of days. If you go and check it out, she's great. Her name is Astro. Uh, she was named in honor of uh, Officer Eric Talley because the Astros were his favorite sport team. Um, so it's really cool. We'd love to be able to bring on another canine in the near future too. So that's really exciting. Um, some of the bad or things that aren't going well, um, we've been struggling in this area for about two months, it looked really good. Um, we upped with back to school, we upped our enforcement of encampments to three days a week. And what that seemed to do was push people downtown, push people onto the mall. I just drove by there now and it's pristine. It looks really, really great. Uh, we posted uh, last week um, based upon some of the encampment type set up. We actually did post and, and did 72 hour notice. And on Friday went through, arrested a couple of people that wouldn't move and then um, uh, everybody else moved on. Central Park is a continuous struggle. Um, you'll see a couple cameras that have been put up, one on the pro in front of the courthouse, the big camera trees with the lights on top. Um, we're doing those as a pilot program. Uh, there's one down in Central Park. Um, that's really to be used a lot on our stamps work, but it, it's a great deterrent for people that are potentially committing crimes. So we're hoping those are successful. Um, we've had uh, a decent amount of crime in and around Central Park. We did an operation Wednesday, it bled over onto 1300 block of Pearl where we arrested 
quite a few people in one day. We had undercover officers out. We had surveillance, and we we took off two or three significant drug dealers uh, that are bringing fentanyl down here. It's increasing the overdose, and so it's a constant struggle for us. Um, adding to that struggle, the jail is, as of last week, uh, telling us they will no longer at least temporarily take any municipal arrests or warrants because they're full. That's extremely problematic for us. Uh, and I'm hoping that's a temporary thing. I don't envy the sheriff. It's, it, there's a lot of issues that lead to the jail being full, short staffed, but uh, we don't get to turn off the 911 calls. We don't get to not respond when we're called. And so not being able to jail people when it's necessary and appropriate on, on misdemeanor municipal charges is tough. And so we're going to work through that. Um, they're still taking any other serious crime. So we're not, it's like we're not taking people to jail, but uh, constant struggle there. We're still seeing a constant struggle with PR bonds. Uh, we had a, a guy, stabbed a guy right outside our doors here three weeks ago. Uh, our cops found him right nearby. Uh, he even showed us where the knife was. Uh, and he was two days after he was arrested, given a PR bond and released. Uh, we re-arrested him Thursday. In fact, the chief and I were walking here for a meeting, and he was out here berating uh, one of the civilian park rangers. Chief and I started to chase him down, and um, he got away. There's more to that story, but uh, um, it was very fast. But anyway, uh, <laughs> he turned out we found him a little bit later. He's stolen another bike downtown. He had over 50 fentanyl pills on him at that point, resisted arrest again. Um, and so he was out on a PR bond, unacceptable. And um, that's some of the struggles that we're dealing with. Uh, the DA's office is a great partner and they continuously, when, especially when we go to them and say, hey, this person's a menace, please uh, ask, you know, do, try to keep them in custody at least until they can see a judge. Um, unfortunately, that's uh, just a, an interesting challenge that we're dealing with. So all of that to be said, um, we're well aware of the issues. Uh, we're all, all over them. We're offering overtime for officers for increased presence. We're going to, do, as, the, as we come back into the holiday season, over time uh, in, in downtown, over time in the shopping areas, uh, the cops are exhausted, though, and uh, sometimes it's hard to even get those filled. So I um, had some great meetings with business community. Terry uh, facilitated one last week. Um, we've heard loud and clear uh, from them of some of their frustrations, and we're working on those. Uh, 35 people came to the Reimagining Policing Open Comment at Council the other night, and we heard overwhelmingly from a lot of the business community that uh, there's issues we're, we're going to continue to work through. So that's kind of the high level overview of some of the things going on. Um, we're big time up staff for this weekend with an 8 p.m. game. We have some serious concerns about uh, some of the all day drinking and then the game at eight. And obviously it's CSU. I mean, why? I will not pledge my allegiance to either team. The PM. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say the Q word, Chris. <laughs> So we believe we have adequate resources here and then uh, just kind of see what happens. That's kind of the, the overview. Any questions that you have, I'm happy to. Is there anything in the reimagine policing concept about this problem with the jail? I mean, that, it's been a problem since COVID. It, I mean, both with more serious crime and with just the petty theft. I mean, they know they can get away with anything. So it's it's really, as you right. tell you, it's got to be perfect. I, I don't disagree with you. And it's not in the plan because the plan is really our strategic plan of what we're going to do. Um, when, when the sheriff has to make those tough decisions like shutting us off from municipal violations, we share that with council. We share that with uh, the city manager. And then, you know, there's a whole, the sheriff has county commissioners, all of those things. And so, um, are in a perfect world, you know, the county on their end would realize that they need to do something different and do whatever it is the sheriff needs, whether it's bodies or either the alternative sentence facility is being built, but it's a couple of years out. And so uh, really we're trying to keep doing our part um, and hopefully, you know, hope, hope, hoping by just being factual about what's going on that something changes over on that end. It's it's definitely not a lack of the sheriff not wanting to be our partner. Sure. He's a great he's a great partner, but it, it's a different set of challenges. And so, um, yeah. That seems to be the continual bottom. It is. Two, there's two more pieces to that. One is that there's a lot of people, a huge backup on people waiting to go to the state hospital. Colorado has a dismal mental health uh, uh, resources that's last in the country. And so there's a just a great deal of people waiting in custody to go to Pueblo. Um, 
and uh, which it's a beautiful place. Um, <laughs> but uh, the second piece of that is there's a ton of people, like 90, 80 to 90% of the people in custody are waiting trial because trials got super backed up during COVID. So like Michael, they opened up another courtroom. They're trying to try people left and right. That's not a custody. So if, um, and, and then the other part is there's a bunch of people in custody of the Department of Corrections and they're really slow to come pick up people and those are people you can't release. Those are people that need to go back to prison because they, they're serious defenders. And so that's that's the state of affairs that they share with us, and it's a constant struggle for them. Yes. Um, thanks for sharing. That was helpful context. Um, I think that what I guess I noticed about the, the homeless population is that they sort of migrate based on times of day. And so... Um, I think the one, I know that it sounded like you're short staffed and I was thinking about the ambassadors, but even just like Thursday night, my husband and I walking on the Pearl Street mall, like when it feels empty and it will feel like this a little bit more when it gets colder. And then there's um, a group of people there. It's not an encampment technically because there's not tents, but just like a lot of people around, like there's the perception of feeling not safe if they don't see police or yep. ambassadors. So I think... I think even if the problem, these are not easy problems to solve, right? I think when you're, especially like someone like me, a small woman, and like, it's pretty empty and you don't see anyone around that could help you if something went wrong, if there was someone who was high and like, you know, worst case scenario, I think that's when the public, you feel more unsafe versus like every city has problems. Right. But if you feel like if something would go wrong, people would help you, then you don't feel scared. Yeah. So I guess to me, I'm curious about how the sort of police and or ambassadors could work together to with that natural migration that happens at night and day and kind of be more of a presence there in the interim before so there are more. All valid concerns and what we're experiencing. So our mall team works daytime hours. If we are able to upstaff that, we'll stretch into the evening. Um, and it, it really is just a matter of having the resources to put the number of officers. So our patrol officers um, will do like on my way over here, there's a couple of them that called out that they're going to be on foot patrol in the mall. It's all dependent upon calls. Yeah. And some nights they're just running 911 call, the 911 call. So it's really just dependent upon when they can get out and do that. Yeah. Perfect world we'd have back. We used to have eight officers inside of the mall. We have basically two and a half right now. Um, so that's part of that is once we're able to hopefully get where we need to be, we can upstaff that. But, okay. but what we share with the businesses too, is if there's ever any unsafe condition, regardless of staffing, our response times are extremely high compared to the national average. If there's ever a scenario where someone is acting weird, if there's somebody following you, I mean, you don't even have to call 911. You can hit that button on the side of your phone, whatever, seven, 10 times, and it'll call 911 for you. You can text 911 like, a lot of times what we see is people are like, well, we don't want to bother the cops. And it's like, no, if somebody's making you feel uneasy, call us. We will get there quick. Um, yeah. And then, you know, so it may not be an encampment, but if people are setting up and they're, they're like the other day, there were no tents, but it looked like somebody's living room over there on the, on the courthouse lawn. Yeah. We'll notice that for 72 hours, you know, and okay. we'll get it. So keep reporting it to inquire Boulder if, even if there's no tents, because um, it, it probably does fit the definition of the cabin unless it's just one single person. That's, is that uh, a phone number? Or is there like a Boulder Boulder website? You just go with that for you to report when you see cabinets. The ones on the mall get reported quite frequently, but it can't hurt to have additional you know, reports. So I don't have an easy answer for you. I guess what I'm saying. But, yeah, it's. I think it's less that it's more of the perception because we got this survey. I don't know if you, I think you might've, maybe you saw, saw it. I think that down the Boulder partnerships did it where people feel unsafe yep. and it's a feeling, it's a perception that yep. is worse when it's less crowded around. I don't think people feel this way when there's a ton of people around in the right. same way. So just thinking of lighting, mm -hmm. like some solutions and they, that yeah, can lighting help. Lighting is a tough issue. Both. I know it's a tough issue, but the perception of lack of safety is even stronger than what the reality is. And I think that's I think that's part of the issue that I don't know if we've seen any like real, well, I want to know about them quick kind of responses to like, this is a dark block, people avoid it. Let's do something or let's put someone here where I think those things would help change that like perception that Boulder is getting more and more dangerous when and I would I, I would encourage any of you all as a group that if that if those conditions exist to report those to council, report those to, to the proper 
people, um, you know, there is a the dark skies or ordinance or is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. So we and we deal with the same thing. When we had the guy on the hill last year that was perpetrating against women, like he was able just to go very freely in and out of dark, really dark blocks and alleys. And it's like, yeah. you know, so um, from our end, we there's a lot of things that you know Make we can talk back. to yeah. that will will help alleviate somebody feeling comfortable. I think the communication is a big deal. I really appreciate the police working and the DA working with the downtown community for those meetings. I think those are really helpful just because the more you know, the more you understand, the business community understands the issues. I think there's more compassion and understanding and collaboration. So I really appreciate the time that your team puts forward to, to talk to the business community. And I'll just say that if there's any meeting, if there's any individual business that wants us to come out and do an assessment on what they can do better to deter crime. We have a whole program that will come out and evaluate a business and do crime prevention through environmental design. Um, it's just a matter of, of just letting us know when there's something we'll come, we'll come speak, listen to concerns and try to do what we can. One more thing. So I think Boulder transportation goals are directly at odds with the bike scenario, which is like, everyone's afraid to park their bikes as it'll get stolen. And like, there's my bike right there because I would never park it out here. Yeah. If it's a, and just in the space. Because I feel like so, like, how do we as a city move forward with like what I think we all want to be like potentially a city with less cars than any other city? Like that's the vision, but the reality is this crazy, sophisticated bike stealing ring and mm-hmm. one offs that you know people I probably are biking less because they're afraid to bring, to park their bikes downtown. So like, how can the police help and like kind of work on a, on a plan to address, I think, yeah. those two goals that make, that make that goal really tough, I think. So, great question. The first thing we do is encourage everybody to put their bike in their bike index. Um, if you go to the bike index, it's a national website. We're all over it. Um, it really helps us because I can tell you like the guy the other day that he chased down that stabber he had stolen a bike and he even said yeah you guys took my bike this morning so i I took this one um it wasn't in the bike index so literally if you have you know this bike and we find it with an unhoused person or whoever and you know there's no serial number we can look by make model and what we ask on the bike index you'll actually take a picture with your bike and say this is my bike it just helps us i mean we recover stolen bikes left and right um we've been posting if you follow us especially on instagram we post uh, in the facebook like uh stories on Facebook. When we have people that have pictures of their bikes, we take the report, we put those out. This bike's been stolen. Um, we actually get decent success with that. Um, and then obviously just making sure that when people lock their bikes, that they have proper locks um, or sadly two locks. Um, and then we do have a bait bike program that we've been doing operations with. It, 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 it has a little bit of an impact when we catch somebody that steals one of our bikes. Um, at the end of the day, um, there is, you know, for someone stealing a bicycle as a property crime, there's a very reasonable uh, chance they won't go to jail at all. Yeah. Probably get a summons. And so um, we kind of have to wait till they may fail to appear on that or something like that. So um, there's a lot of things, uh, but check out the bike index. That's a huge part of it. It's not going to necessarily prevent the theft, but it makes it much easier for us to get it back to you and then make much, much easier if it's two in the morning and we find an encampment with six or seven bikes where they can go through the index and go, this one's stolen, this one's stolen. We're gonna seize it and get it back to the owner. And is it in like typically in okay condition? Usually, I mean, sometimes we do have people okay. that are just cutting bikes up for I don't yeah. know what reason to sell scrap metal, but most of the time, you know, you'll see people out here and you're riding a really expensive bike. Um, you know, it, it just depends on what they're using it for. But we'll also find we've we've done search warrants on more organized rings, and there's like hundred high-end bikes in the garage somewhere. Yep. To that end, and that's my last question. I don't know how many people know about the bike index and like, or, you know, it's one of those things. I'm not the most organized person sometimes where I like until something bad happens, you're like, shoot, I should have done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe, I I, I don't know if there's communication we plans, put it like all, put it where you lock bikes or like all the vendors. But whenever you lock a bike, I feel like that's the moment where you could prompt someone to actually sign up. That's yeah. actually great. It's like to put a sticker. Like, you can have a yeah. QR code or something yeah. there. I, um, I like that. Because I just thought, I don't know if I have mine signed up. My, all my bikes. You maybe have one bike, but not all of them. So 
I'm just don't yeah. do it with our car crunching people because that's a great idea for an hour. Next time you chase someone, you should skip scooter. Right? The line scooter. The line scooter. So by the time I paid, then yeah. just steal one. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? It's hard to steal them. <laughs> great. Well, let's move on to our next item. Let's move on our Thank you, uh, Thank you for uh, Officer Redford. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Terry, I saw you at the event on Friday. I didn't say hi because I didn't want to accost you with my family, but uh, thanks for putting that on. You should have said hi, Don. It would have been great to see you in person. Uh, well, thank you all for having me. Um, just, I don't know, Steve, are you still there? Did no. you just, um, I cannot thank them enough. Every time I see an officer, I try to <clears> thank <throat> them. If anyone's been to the 1300 block since Friday, um, it looks like a different place. Uh, it's really clean and safe and um, lovely down there right now. So we're incredibly grateful for all of the actions that were taken over the past few days, um, especially leading up to the stampede. Um, the 1300 block is is just in tip top shape right now. Um, the camera that he was speaking about is up there. And it, um, as far as I know, it's going to be there at least through the weekend. Uh, our in our ideal world, uh, we would advocate for it being a permanent fixture. Um, it seems to be doing a lot in deterring bad behavior. So we're eternally grateful for whatever happened the past few days that really got that block clean. Um, so right now, the Business Improvement District, we're in the process of getting all of our plans in order for 2024. Uh, first of all, exciting news. Uh, we have a new CEO. Her name is Bettina Swager. Swager? Swager. I keep saying it wrong. Um, she's coming to us from San Luis Obispo. Um, she will be here in late November. So you guys are kind of stuck with me in the interim, but um, Bettina and I have been in contact and we're really excited to welcome her. Um, Slow, as they call it, is very similar to downtown Boulder. Um, they're a college town. They're, they have really high rents and housing is an issue. So a lot of the things that we're experiencing in Boulder, she's extremely familiar with. She also has um, ties to Colorado and she has a lot of really good friends that are in Boulder. So we'll be excited for her to get started in late November. Um, until then, next week, we will go in front of our board of directors to get our 2024 work plan and budget approved. Once the board approves it, we will go um, to council in early or mid-October for council approval. Um, backing up just a little bit about the ambassador program. Um, last week, I did go to the finance committee, copied Mark and Chris uh, and a few other people. Uh, we're asking for an additional about $103,000 to cover the ambassador program for 2024. What that money will do will allow us to give ambassadors a raise of about a dollar. So right, they're about at twenty dollars right now. Um, the raise will bring them to somewhere between twenty dollars and fifty cents to twenty one dollars an hour. Um, it's kind of critical for recruitment and retention right now, as um, the ambassadors do a lot of really hard work, and um, our counterpart organization in. Denver, the Col uh, Colfax bid, uh, we want to be more competitive with their rates. Um, so I did send a letter off to council this morning, also requesting support of that request for the additional 103000 It goes kind of in line. There's a budget line item right now for about, I think it's up 489000 in the 2024 budget to give um, hourly employees and city contractors a living wage increase to 22, a little over $22 an hour. Um, in many regards, the ambassadors are contractors of the city with how much um, the city contributes to the program. So we are, um, we have our fingers crossed that we'll be able to do that. If we have a flat budget for the program next year, um, we still feel that it's a priority to get the ambassadors that really small pay increase. But what that will mean is a reduction in services in order to accomplish that. Um, and unfortunately, kind of what you guys were just talking about, the 
the, their focus of work will really fall under clean and safe that happens during the day. So a lot of the decrease in hours is going to have to come in the evening hours. Um, so we are hopeful we're moving that forward. Um, we know that there's a public hearing on the budget coming up the first week of October, and we already have um, some allies ready to speak and um, to encourage uh, council to hopefully find that increased funding for us so we can keep that program going strong. Um, in regards to the Lime Scooters, in the past two days, I've gotten comments from some different business owners. I'm not sure what's going on. I actually sent an email to Chris this afternoon. Um, we were told that the Pearl Street Mall was a no scooter zone and also the slow area was surrounding the downtown. People are speeding down the mall in the scooters. And yes, uh, Sunday, um, one of the business owners told me that in front of a large audience, a guy who was um, going really fast actually flipped off and over the handlebars. And when he landed on the ground, people actually cheered because um, he almost hit a lot of people walking on the mall. So um, we'd love to try to get ahead of that issue, figure out if um, the no scooter zone and the slow zones are actually in place because it doesn't seem like they're working really well at the moment. Um, and we've had a lot of people also, uh, they didn't know they were coming. And so um, we'll definitely try to help spread the word and give out all of the correct information to the business community. Um, Terry, just so you know what the, the what our position was when we were in this letter we're giving to the transportation mobility, we were talking about that we had recommended a slow zone that's like all the way from beyond the library to like this huge, this much bigger area because the, all of that, not just Pearl Street itself, which is a no-go zone, but like the whole neighborhood you know, basically all of caged in essence is where people walk. Yeah, definitely, Don. And we were told right before they launched that that was already in place or we were under the assumption that it was in place. So to get that clarified or. And so what happened is that that didn't happen. That that slow zone is not that big. That's what we were asking for. And that's not what happened. I wanted eh, gotcha. as partners with the DBP, that's the D DMC was looking for a very large slow zone. And that was not part of the plan. Gotcha. Okay. Well, hopefully we can all get that fixed so everybody feels safe. Um, because again, the ambassadors can do their best to educate people, but they can't enforce anything. So it's a challenge. Um, we're dealing with skateboarders, cyclists, and now the scooters. So, um, that's just a little overwhelming. Um, that is a question. Okay. What do you mean by they can't enforce? Like, what are they? What can they say? They like can you say can't... it's this... a city ordinance. You're, you know, please get off your bike. Please get off your scooter. Um, I will tell you, I was standing with an officer last week who had to yell at one person three times to get off their bike, and he was a fully um, in uniform officer, and the person completely disregarded that. So for our poor ambassadors to be standing out there screaming at people to please follow the rules, um, that's all we can do. We don't have any form of punishment or anything we can have them enact. So um, there, people seem a lot more defiant these days too. So um, other than that, we're wrapping up. Um, you guys mentioned Boulder Social Streets. So um, DBP, our events team has been overseeing efforts on 13th Street. Uh, as Don mentioned, Friday, uh, we had the best intention of getting people there for like a pre-stampede event. However, um, with a big event already planned on the Pearl Street Mall, trying to divert attention down to that area was extremely tricky. Uh, even with free ice cream and free shaved ice, people already had their plans to be on the mall and that's definitely where they wanted to stay. Um, we're working closely with uh, Community Vitality Parking Services in helping launch the um, gateless garage system. So we have a whole communication plan in place to make sure that that goes smoothly. Um, we had an earlier meeting um, yesterday 
talking about some of the challenges with the stampede and also with on game day and um, the garages backing up as people are trying to get out. Uh, we're looking forward to that gateless system working seamlessly to make sure people move through the garages a lot more efficiently moving forward. Um, I think that covers everything. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I would say, Terry, um, the ambassador program, I think we all agree that it's super important. And in your appeal to council, if everyone else agrees, I think it makes sense that you can say you presented this concept about raises to us and we enthusiastically agree that it's an important source of safety for downtown and we completely support it. Would it help if we write a letter or support or do you think that it's gonna be approved? And if you do, then- You know, no, I, I don't have any idea. A letter of a support would mean the world to us um, as we gear up our efforts. Um, if that's something that you guys would be willing to do, we would be extremely grateful. I think we'll touch a little bit on this topic in the uh, I was budget update. Budget. Well. Okay. 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 I am game for us to write a letter. If Susan or Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind taking the lead of just a simple paragraph saying how this yeah. ladders to safety and so on. Since I wrote the other one, I wouldn't mind having someone else write this one. What are you presenting, Terry? Um, the public hearing on the budget is uh, October 5th, I believe, Chris. is it? Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. Correct. So Thank we're going to gear up efforts to try to have everybody um, send letters. And I we already have a couple of people lined up to um, be part of the public speaking um, portion of that hearing as well. Thank you all. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Terry, for your efforts as the stand-in too. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Um, matters from staff, Mark Wolf. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Um, Chris, do you want to do a little preamble before I yes. jump to it? So uh, yeah, thank you, Mark, for being here as city's budget officer. As you recall, at our last DMC meeting, uh, the staff team presented our, uh, our preliminary uh, budget work that we'd been doing. We, we touched on a lot of topics that has since um, gone uh, to the broader city budget team. And uh, the, our requests for CV were balanced and evaluated next to all of the asks of all the departments of the city. Um, and there have been some adjustments that uh, are being looked at to help achieve all of the goals that we were seeking to achieve. And uh, what we want to acknowledge that uh, we got an affirmative vote uh, from you all at the last meeting. And we want to be able to share with council uh, a budget that you all uh, are confidently standing behind. And so uh, we have invited uh, Mark here to talk kind of about the citywide um, uh, budget considerations and trade-offs, and specifically um, some conversation around the ambassador program, where we did discuss you know, this whole need for uh, additional funding for the ambassador program at the previous DMC meeting. You all supported spending some Cajun dollars on those enhancements. Uh, since then, taking a look at all the other competing needs on the general fund, and the general fund is paying for a significant majority of the ambassador program up till now. Um, and so uh, the proposal for 2024 includes uh, shifting at least for 2024, the ambassador program to Cajun. Hmm. So um, it doesn't mean that we can't entertain additional funding hmm. to meet uh, Terry's and DBP's requests, um, but it's quite likely that, that so we'd be looking to the Cajun fund to make those uh, expansions. There are investors on the Hill Improvement District as well, right? Do they, Correct. Do so, they cross over at all or is it? It's all pulling from the same team essentially, but the general fund is still contributing to 
um, the ambassador program in the civic area and on the Hill. Um, the CU contribution is, is uh, contributing to the amb ambassadors on the Hill. Um, I think the work that Mark and his team have done is, is made sure that they separated the, the downtown ambassador team would be covered primarily from Cajun dollars. And if we want to increase from the three seventy three hundred seventy two thousand dollars um, that's currently allocated, that we could do that, but it would probably the council probably see that coming from the from the Cajun fund. Do you? It said C. I was reading C. U. gave additional funding of forty five thousand. Is that all they have given? That is all total. So I can, that that's a pilot program that we did okay. with them, and it's basically running through first quarter. So um, we have tried, we, we're also talking to CU right now because in negotiations for the block by block contract, it would be much easier if we were able to do it holistically for the entire fiscal year 2024. Um, so we are working with CU right now in trying to um, have them join us for the second through the fourth quarter. Uh, they only yeah. have, just so we're clear on that, the majority of the ambassadors are downtown. They yeah. have a team lead and one dedicated ambassador up on the hill. Okay. So outside of that, Mark, is there anything more that you want to dive into? Um, sure, just a, a little bit. Um, broader context, uh, you know, two funds in particular, we uh, needed to come up with some creative solutions. Uh, general fund is one we always talk about, um, but also the uh, community culture resilience safety tax or primary uh, capital um, tax uh, for um, general uh, capital projects across the city. Um, so those are really the two areas that um, we were looking across all funds really to figure out a way to meet our uh, community goals. And so um, with uh, the general fund in particular, uh, you know, we had very limited room going into the budget. We knew we would have limited room to add ongoing things. So new services, new people, um, because of decisions that we made in 23 to, for new programs, you know, expanded programs like um, like our um, safe and managed public spaces efforts, like uh, day services center, which is coming, like the program, so things like that. that we can to as a city, twenty-three, um, and then um, you know certainly we had some um, positive news in terms of revenue, maybe not for yourselves on uh, property tax. Um, and, um, some of the impact of the library uh, district being created, freeing up some of those resources. And so that's balanced with sales and use tax flowing as inflation comes down, we're seeing sales tax um, will slow down. So all that kind of led to us um, anticipating about $3 million worth of room in the general fund to add on things. And from departments, we received over $26 million in the class, um, about almost 100 FTE investments. So um, the scale was um, large and um, we, look to uh, funds where we could to try to help out. And so shortening a long process um, into a few sentences, but um, many funds were asked to kind of chip in where we could. Parks and Rec um, is a good example and looking at all of the dedicated funding sources and CAGIT is another example where um, certainly the, the fund is healthy, balanced with knowing that the primary focus is the capital infrastructure um, in the district. And so, um, the recommended budget they propose, as Chris mentioned, splitting the cost of the ambassador program, one third of general fund, two thirds um, Cajun. Um, and I'll just note that for the, the safe and managed uh, spaces program, um, the two aspects of that program that are still funded with one time dollars, so kind of pilot in nature, are the ambassador program and the urban park rangers program. Both of those are extended in 2024 one time dollars as, as well. So both both aspects continue, but not um, with ongoing funding um, at the moment, knowing we need a permanent solution. Um, so that split is about 125, 125,000 125, or 25,000 in general fund, 250,000 in Cajun. 
the 103 that Terry mentioned, I, I would imagine that that will come up at council on Thursday because the, the letter, Terry's letter, was sent to um, our financial strategy committee. Um, what we're trying to do with city council, just for your awareness, is to have them make recommended changes to the recommended budget prior to first reading. So our goal is always to have a clean first reading of the budget so we can have an adopted budget. That's uh, so timing wise, it's helpful. I certainly am willing to take comments from DMC this evening um, if council does raise um, the additional ask. Um, from a staff perspective, I'll just say that we probably would recommend pulling any additional dollars from the general fund constraints and that, that 103 would be an ongoing cost likely but saying to pilot, um, if you will, uh, know that the intent would be for that to be um, wages going to people, which is ongoing. So yeah. I, I think it helps. I mean, at that, I know council will do what they want at the stage with the budget, um, uh, but certainly if there's support for looking at cages for that additional cost, they think that helps, um, I guarantee. So that's on Sam's, and happy to answer questions on that. Um, and then as it relates to capital, I think it's also important to mention that with the CCRS, we, our target number was uh, looking at over the six years. So the, uh, backing up a second, sorry. Uh, CCRS is a 15 year tax. I think that's right. Um, about a 200 and some million dollar tax over the life um, of it. And so uh, we had asked departments to submit the total costs um, of, of some of the major projects that were listed in the ballot and others um, that would qualify under CCRS, that list was long and exceeded our capacity within the fund as well. Uh, so we were able to present a recommended CCRS budget that advances some of the major projects, um, including East Bullet Community Center improvements here in the civic area phase two, replacing two of our fire stations. There is some dollars for uh, Pearl Street, which was another um, main project, a refresh or revitalization. Um, but again, uh, seeking cage of help uh, for some of that projects. One million dollars is in the CCRS. I recommend a budget for that project at, at, um, in 26, I believe, and two million in, in cage of a couple of resources. Um, so that number we'll we find as we get closer to that project. Obviously, that's a broader project. But just the city, um, but um, again, just pointing out that that's a change from uh, what people all saw in July. Those are the significant ones. Um, if I missed anything, that sounds right. It all come from the retirement of that debt. Saw that. And that so, helps. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, you know, basically, you all already voted affirmatively in support yeah. of the budget that Seth's been developing, and so we can keep that vote on the record unless the commissioners who are present today feel like these adjustments are, are untenable and like to go a different direction. I confess I have a little bit of a hard time hearing Mark for whatever reason. I don't know if it's just the intonation of his voice over the mic, so that's kind of challenging for me. Maybe my one question that I heard just from the beginning of this part of the conversation when we had the sidebar about how the the money going from uh, caged into the ambassadors reading between the lines there is there like a request that the dmc put more money towards it or something i just didn't like i had a hard enough time hearing i just didn't know what the outcome of that was can you hear me now try to yeah. speak uh, and so, maybe could you, lisa could you move the camera over too Thanks. So my, my general point was, I, I don't know what council would do. Council could certainly add general fund money to, to fulfill uh, Terry's request. I, I think it helps We just staff would not recommend pulling additional general fund dollars at this point. I think it helps if the commission did support additional cage of dollars for that 103,000. Um, no promises, but uh, I do think it helps the discussion with council. From from my perspective, I haven't checked that with anybody, but <laughs> yeah. from a budget perspective. So as we remember, we did. I think DMC did also. We put money where our mouth was for the day shelter too. Correct in some sort of way. No, I don't, I don't think so. We did for the art project. Is that what you're thinking? I don't think we're supporting 
this is where I just like, th that's why I, I, I am confused. I just remember at one point we were going to write a letter this there, like we were, we were in support of the day center. And I, Chris, I recall you saying, well, put your money where your mouth is a little bit. It's one thing to say NIMBY. Of <laughs> I don't remember saying that. <laughs> he was asking you to make a personal donation. So, well, but well, I remember we, you just saying it's like a little bit NIMBY of like, well, it's great. It's over there. If you did, if, if DMC put some, that's uh, I'm summarizing briefly. So in the uh, budget that we drafted, we did include $200,000 um, for safety. Um, then we'd suggested that could go to expanding the ambassador program. Once that went in the hopper of the citywide budget process, um, that $200,000 actually turned into $250,000. And it, was, and it was instead of the general fund contribution. So what Mark is asking for now is if uh, DMC would like to maybe formally make a, you know, a motion to support additional cage of dollars, but beyond what's already being um, allocated or proposed for 2024 um, of the 250K to, to if, if DMC supports increasing that even more, they'll um, uh, cover the increases that Terry's been suggesting. Then that gives council some you know, affirmative guidance because that's your your role. Your role is to um, recommend a budget um, as an advisory um, board to council, which really is the board of directors of the Central Area General Improvement District. And so if you all think that, that this is a reasonable approach to using uh, the cage of dollars and you, and you have an affirmative vote um, at this meeting to say, yes, even more uh, makes sense to, to help increase wages to fulfill the proposal that Terry's put together, then that just helps council make that decision in October. Does anything need to be cut to meet that additional or no? Is that not it? No, I would just maybe what Teresa would say is like it, it restrains some of your future flexibility for ongoing talks if it becomes permanent. Um, so I, yes. it's something to keep in mind, but uh, because it's operating in nature in that capital, it's something that I wanted to have a conversation about. Right. Yeah, got it. Is the way that 250 that's in there now, is that kind of now? permanently earmarked and it would like, or is that kind of like temporarily? It's being proposed as a one time. So the, the ambassador program is still considered a pilot. So it will be a one time uh, budget allocation for 2024, which means that next year when we're planning the 2025 budget, we need to have uh, the conversation again to determine whether or not, or if the, if the program is going to continue, um, permanently, where are the, the ongoing funds come from? Where are they going to come from? Because the moment that you make a uh, program ongoing, then those resources are no longer available to be leveraged for capital campaigns, bonding initiatives, which is really you know, the true intention of the, the GID funds are, are more for the capital side. So the yeah. more that we eat away at operating, the less leverage we have for future capital campaigns. Can I make a motion to support that? One time. Uh, yeah. this... The telling city council that Cajun will contribute. I would, I would like to discuss this more before we move. Personally. Okay. Um, you want me to step if... away? Is it, I don't, I'm happy to get, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to be here. Just tell me if you want me to. It's a public meeting. You're welcome to hear. I just say maybe don't, uh, yeah, don't, uh, um, uh, opine uh, <laughs> Well, my reasoning is that while I, in, in an ideal scenario, anyone who has a financial stake would contribute. That's my approach. I don't think government should pay for everything. CU, businesses, ideally everyone would contribute, but we don't want the, pro the program. We know how important it is and we want it to be stable. And it sounds like it will be unstable if we don't increase the spend and that um so 
leaving it to the council to pull from anything else in the general fund of which we know the priorities are home, homeless center, affordable housing. And this isn't like on their top 10, then I, I feel that the best way to keep it moving is that we provide additional support in Cajun where it's most acutely felt by not having night staff or having less hours, it's going to affect the downtown the most so. So that's why, that's why I support this path. The reason I wanted to question it, not that I'm against it, but I just wanted to question it is if council looks to DMC to be the one funding it as this pilot program, at what point does it stop being a pilot program? And at what point does the DMC not take the onus of being the funder for it when we may need money for something else? And so I just wanted to understand kind of what the bigger picture implications of go, you know, going all, you know, we're, we've, we've put our chips down, now we're we going all in, you know, with it. And how does that impact what, how that hap hits with the, as we move for into future years and as we move from a pilot program, you know, what's yeah. the domino effect? I, my response would be like, I would want to give Terry and team more leeway to raise money from for-profit entities to expand the program. Because government is not an endless well of funding. And, but to be in a crunch to raise money to like fund a program is really tough. Unless, you know, they're very good at fundraising. But like the idea that it's in partnership with a lot of different organizations that have a stake. And so, but that takes time to have like a big campaign to like get big, you know, amounts of funding for a continual program. So an interim one-year solution seems like a good solution for not saying that we're going to contribute for like five, 10 years, right? We're just saying the next year. Mark, I wondered, you know, since you're, this is all so new to me. I don't really deal with the budgets of the city that much. And I think you do it a little bit more than I do, Mark. How, how do you forecast this into the future? And, you know, do you have any recommendations maybe? It's a fair question. I, to Chris's point, we're going to have to make a decision on the permanence of this program next year. We're essentially, the way we're recommending it is to kick the can and to get one more year of data uh, from both the Urban Park Ranger uh, program and the Ambassador program and say, how does our approach to safe and managed public spaces work? Um, and then we answer the question in 25. Do we make these aspects permanent and then where do we fund them? I, I do think you're indicating support for perhaps a permanent solution where CAGED is paying for two thirds, three quarters of, of a program uh, for, for the ambassador program. And you're right, I mean, you can't predict the future. Uh, certainly things can come over the fence and now you have this ongoing cost that's there. I think overall, CAGED is a healthy fund. You have the ability to, to make it work. Uh, if it's a top priority of the commission, then it's helpful for council to know that at this stage of, of budget development. I um, love your answer and approach, Mark. Thank you. That's yeah, you, you're going to continue, but that like I wanted to know just what's the longer interim impact. And I guess maybe I I'd almost want to put a sticky note on it that says, Council, what are you going to do for the long term? <laughs> put it off. <laughs> yeah, I mean I. I don't want to be step out of turn, but I mean, certainly knowing that you all support the permanence of the program is helpful knowledge. Yeah. I, again, they, they can uh, I think we love it. And it's, it's compare the price of the, an ambassador versus a police officer. Yeah. Um, and you get a large amount of the impact that you do from an officer, maybe not the full impact, but still you get the, it's, it's, to me, it's money well spent. Yeah, and all these approaches go hand in hand. There's no one solution to safety. It's all of these different things. And this is an important part of that. And that's, it's our number one priority. So I think it makes sense to publicly support it. So if we wanted to move it now, oh, do you, is, so are we saying a certain number now? It was 200, now it's 249. Is there a new number we're saying? The new number would be you know, three fifty, yeah, 
352? Is that right? Oh, it's 350-ish. Yeah, 350-ish, but $352,000 sounds like. Maybe three. I'm trying to think of one way to simplify. I, I think if you're leaving your recommendation, your positive recommendation on the budget as it stands, yes. then that would be inclusive of the changes that we've so, already made. Right. So then I think the the extra information we would need tonight is on the additional request. 103. Yeah. So if there was a, a motion that passed in support of an additional $103,000 from Cajun to support um, the increased investor budget. I would move what he said. <laughs> and support also, not just the dollar amount, but of um, downtown Boulder partnership and their stewardship and use of those funds. Is it a motion? It's a motion. Can I second the motion? <laughs> is that, we is have. that clearly said? Does it, did you get his eloquent? Do we have to all vote all in favor? As long as, yeah, if Don agrees, then uh, we're good. I agree. All right, and I'll make sure that Lisa, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a motion to recommend 103,000 additional from Cajun budget to support ambassador program expansion, something along those lines. Yeah, the, and the DVP part of it as well. Yes, that's good. <laughs> Terry had a nice little note in our chat. Thank you so much. Your support means a lot to us. And it really is a big deal. The safety is the most important fight. The first thing we need to revitalize downtown because um, that snowballs into so many other parts of people wanting to work and people wanting to go to restaurants and all these different things. I think it's so important. Um, before we move on to garage improvements updates, um, I wanted to note one other thing in the chat that Lane had mentioned that, Terry, there are four other emails from the Hill residents about large numbers of lime scooters on our lawns, sidewalks, and ADA access ramps. They are sent to council members by Hill residents. So council is hearing about lime, people upset by lime directly from residents. We can continue with talking to transportation mobility. We could potentially, you know, there is precedent for the community is talking to council directly about Lyme. Hearing no one else say, hey, Don, let's change. I think we're going to stick with transportation mobility. But that was my reading oh, between the lines right. is, is oh, do yeah. we go to council or do we just go to transportation mobility? I still think we start with transportation. Mobility. I mean, I, it's a one year contract. So if the goal is to ended after a year that's more time I mean, that's fine you know what i mean i just like, wanted to put the chat into con into into uh into record here difference yeah so moving on uh we're doing well on time overall matters from commit uh matters from staff garage improvement updates so we have christine edwards here our senior manager of operations and maintenance uh, she is just going to share some timelines. There's a lot going on in the garages right now. Um, you all may have noticed from lollipop sign replacements to power washings and restriping to installation of cameras for our gateless system. Uh, it goes on and on. So with everything happening all once, we thought it would be a good time to update DMC on um, various problems in the garage. So Christine, over to you. And you should have, yep, good. We can't hear you though. Did it work? Are we yes. on? We did it. Yay. Okay, no, just for a second. Hold on. I'm trying to get all my screens organized. We did it. Okay, so garage improvements. This is just a quick high level overview for everyone here. Um, there are, we have details. We're constantly sending updates and updating our website with information. Um, we're working with Terry and crew to get the word out, um, but wanted to give you an idea of what we're doing with those capital infrastructure dollars that Cajun has been, um, has been, I'm sorry, DMC has been responsible for. So 
some of the things that we have done so far, I don't know if everybody remembers back in July and August, we had RTD closed for uh, ramp repairs. So that was exciting. We have power washed and striped spruce, uh, the spruce garage, the lollipop sign project. Do you all know what the lollipop signs are? Signs in front of all of the garages. They're gonna light up. They're gonna tell you how many spots are available within the garages. It's exciting. Uh, but yeah, so we have uh, we have that process that in process. Um, we've started. I don't know if everybody knows. We're starting the conversion from the RTV Eco Passes to an online system, and we did lots of elevator work, specifically at 1500 Pearl, which was exciting. Uh, just for fun fact for everybody, our power washing and striping was so successful that the folks at Cedar and Hyde decided to do a photo shoot in our brand newly striped garages. So ignore the people in pretty clothes. Look at that amazing striping. You're welcome. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, but wanted to let you guys know that what is coming up next. So the big push right now is we're going gateless. I'm sure you've heard, heard about it over and over again. We're really excited. It's going to be great, especially on nights like um, last Friday where we had the stampede and there were lines. It was like trying to get out of uh, Red Rocks, which is just part of big events. And uh, it will be nice when the gates are not there and blocking everyone. So that we are still on track to go gateless October 1st. As Terry mentioned, um, our team has been working really, really hard to do outreach with all of the per permit holders. Oh, sorry. I copied mostly evening work. I'll change that when I send it to you guys. Um, but we are currently doing some installation on um, cameras in all of the garages, because as you can imagine, we are, what is that, 18 days until launch. So we've got lots going on. Um, this is the parking guidance system where there's mostly evening work happening um, in the in all of the garages, September 17th to October 19th. So this part will come up a little bit later, right after the garage, uh, the garages have gone gateless, but it will tell you where is their parking available, on which levels, let you know how many spaces are available. So it helps people navigate the garages better rather than circling. Um, I guess I should say, are there any questions about those, those parts so far or any additional comments? I know that um, Teresa and Chris have also been, have just been crushing it, specifically Teresa has been rushing it on this whole transfer um indicate less exciting yeah it's gonna be good um okay so up next um we're gonna be doing power washing and striping here at 1500 pearl that's where i am that's why i'm pointing at it behind me um so that's next week it will be september 18th through 22nd we're not going to fully cl close that garage we're going to do the top floors first the um, first two days and then the bottom floors on the second day. So it'll be a little bit tighter of a squeeze, but that garage will still stay open. Um, Randolph, in case you guys haven't noticed, uh, or I guess I should say y'all haven't noticed, um, construction is happening there. It is closed to the public from September 12th, starting today until November 1st. And so there's no public parking. Um, there are a few permit holders that are allowed to park there during construction, but we're trying to make it just permit holders so that they understand the, uh, the movement within that garage, because uh, it will be a nightmare if people don't understand what's going on with construction. Um, there will likely be additional work that has to be done, but there won't be as big of a parking impact um, after November 1st. So in anticipation of going gateless, we're installing speed bumps at the exits of all of the garages to slow people down. Because uh, if you're excited to leave the garage, you might forget that there's a there might be pedestrians walking in front of you. So installing speed bumps to slow folks down. Uh, St. Julian, we are doing some coring behind the wall in the basement to see what's going on behind there. We know that there's water, it's close to Boulder Creek. So checking out what's needed for the waterproofing behind there. Um, we're doing some advanced work on traffic coding. So we're going to be prepping the, um, the garage space in order to add a layer and protect the concrete because when people start coming in and out of the garages, they bring in water and weird chemicals that like to eat away at the concrete. So we're trying to uh, protect the investment as long as possible with traffic coding. 
There's also going to be some stair work. Same thing happens with people's shoes. And when they come in um, from outside and they have stuff on their boots, uh, it starts to eat away at the concrete on the stairs. So it's time for us to take a look at um, that and um, fix that situation. RTD is open, but you should know that the ramp between levels two and three are down to one lane because there's still some work that we're doing in that area. Um, so we have shoring up right now, but based on the work that we're doing at Spruce and um, with all of the garages and, uh, and Randolph, we'll restart some extra work in RTD probably around November. And then at Spruce, where you saw the pretty pictures, we're gonna be doing additional work on the stairs. Um, and then we'll be doing some construction in the area or in the basement uh, later on this year. So any questions about that? Christine, um, yes. this is exciting. Um, will any of the stair work, all the stair work involve cleaning too? Like, is it baked into the project? And it sounds small, but like when things look kind of dirty, then you avoid going to the garage and we want people to go there. So. No, I'm laughing because it's something that our maintenance team deals with on an almost daily basis. Um, so we are, there will be cleaning of the stairs. We're planning to put together, and you'll see in the next slide, more of a, um, this team has been playing a lot of catch up on deferred maintenance that um, during COVID, everyone kind of tightened down on spending, trying to spend on just the, ba the basics because none of us knew what was going to happen when it came to the economy and uh, all of this. So now this crew is playing catch up on uh, on some maintenance stuff, some construction, making sure that there are improvements done. Um, so part of that will be to set a cadence of when does striping and power washing happen, um, how to make sure to make, uh, the main, how to activate the maintenance team in a way that they are providing that level of cleanliness that you're talking about. So that will be coming more details soon, but we're planning to, um, to do power washing and striping on a particular cadence, probably starting in the spring. So um, just so you know. Okay. That's, yeah, that's good. Okay. I was going to say, I can let you know if it smells like urine and I'll message you maybe to do it early. <laughs> do It's not pleasant. In our maintenance team, we sometimes get messages that I um, know it's not desirable. fun. It's not fun. They are amazing. Um, no, but yeah, not. please let us know. And we have them out there every single day. Vinegar really helps. Yeah. They, they've got some special stuff. I went out with them one day and <laughs> they took me on like, this is how we clean up everything. So I was pouring the, the powdery stuff on that absorbs the nastiness and then we're having to sweep it all up. So yeah, they've got some processes, but it's a um, challenging battle that does not yeah. seem to I so, think it really, it really helps for sure. Create like people want to go back there because I hear people say I don't want to go in the garages because the stairs or the elevator smell like urine. Like that's not that much money in the scheme of things to maintain to get people to want to go there. Um, so I think it's a worthy investment. Absolutely, so keep keep up the good work. Thank One you. question that I had on that photo shoot: Did they pay a location fee? No. <laughs> Who knows them? I'm kidding. Terry. Uh, but I really just want the clothes. It's fine. They looked adorable. Uh, but no, they did not pay a location. Or that they would want to do it there. That's a good sign. It's, it's on the up. up. Yeah. <laughs> Must not have been so stinky on that particular day. Just curious. Um, any other questions? Okay. So last slide I have for y'all. Um, so as we were talking about, there's deferred maintenance. We're trying to get ahead of a maintenance plan. So one of the things, one of the projects that we're going to be tackling in 2024, and this is worked into the budget, is we're going to be putting together a CMCG plan. So we're going to be hiring in a consultant to do an assessment of all of the facilities to let us know, like, here are the high priority things. This is how we would stagger the approach. Eventually the goal, and so in case I didn't say it, CMCG is construction manager, general contractor. Um, that's what it stands for. And so the idea is you hire in a general manager and they hire in subs in order to work on a large project. Um, this is similar to what facilities fleet does. So it's uh, it's something that already happens within the city, um, but we're gonna be applying it to the garages. And ideally we'll get ourselves on a cadence where 
all experienced. There's been lots of opening and closing of garages. Ideally, we, um, we would tackle one garage a year and do as much of a um, head to toe refurbishment, cleanup, and then move on to the next garage and get ourselves on a cadence where we're doing one garage a year. It won't feel so scattershot. There will always be things. It's construction where we can, but um, hopefully there will be a little bit more planned cadence that we can we can get ahead of. Uh, since the last time we met, the past couple of times, uh, rates in the garage has changed a little bit. Has there been any feedback or any one chatter from that, from the community? I've not heard too much about it. Teresa, do you know if Sam's been fielding too many questions about that or Chris? I'm aware of. No, I don't think so. I have not heard a thing. And I guess the, are you talking about the rates in the garage haven't changed. Are you talking about the on-street dynamic pricing? Because we haven't gone gateless yet, so it hasn't changed. Yeah, it will go. It, it will change. Yeah, it will change. change. Just, just changing like, after gateless. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what okay. we're doing. Yeah. I think I saw one comment um, from somebody saying, like, you're increasing our rates by a dollar. But, um, but it's only been one. So we'll see what comes of it. Um, Thank you. With a question mark. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for the update. <laughs> Not a problem. All right. So let me see if I can stop sharing. Great. Well, so next matters from commission. It's a proof full of our top priorities. And um, Terry, there's a question I'm going to have for you as part of that. Um, but this is the last page of our packet. And a few items were in yellow. But uh, do we need to discuss, we can discuss the actual wording. The other second part of this that I wanted to know is like these, we use this to kind of like how we measure things. You know, we actually use this kind of to gauge the funding of the, the ambassadors. So the, to a degree, this is helps become our guiding principles to a degree. But are there things that we can do then to help forward some of these items? Are are any of these things that we can actually use to impact our agendas and what we're actually working on? That's maybe great. We have this the list. Can we use this to actually impact change other than what's presented to us? Are any of these things? So let me get more specific with my question. Let's take, uh, it's maybe like the long-term invest, investing planning, creating and implement a five-year vision plan and uh, uh, consider development of underutilized par parcels. You know, so far that's always been when things are brought to us by staff, we deal with them. I didn't know how many of these we could actually become like action items for yeah. us where I know we're not really directing staff to do stuff, but how can we make movement on these? Well, I think it's about when the staff makes their work plan for the year and making sure that those items are reflected in our priorities. Because I don't think that we can say, hey, now work on this thing that you've never heard of before. Right. Are you insinuating, which maybe? If you are, I agree with it of cutting the amount of things if we don't believe there are not things we can act on. Because I'd rather have less. There's a lot here, less that we can actually do stuff related to. Like, and I feel like some of these are more specific, whereas like encourage the work, the return to work. Like, what even does that mean? Like, tell people to go into the office? Like, well, I guess, I guess that's maybe like a, a root of what my question is on this. Thanks, Christine. Uh, you have to drop. Uh, in a way, that's my question. Is I'm still a little bit unclear is like, yes, these are our priorities and these are what we, if they're just what we're measuring things against, it's, I don't mind a longer list. If it's, what can we actually do anything about and 
we can't do anything about considering longer term, you know, when we, when every car self drives and, and so on. Yeah. And we can't actually do anything about that. You know, I can see removing that. So in a way I'm a little bit confused as to like what this list is used for. Yeah, I think it's used for connecting to where our top priorities intersect with like the budget or what letters we put to council. Like if that's why I think the list should be possibly a little smaller and more specific. Um, because I think we're very focused on the top priority, which is our number one, so it makes sense. I think the return to work bullet, I don't know what that means. So I would propose cutting it unless we know what it means. And well, I, I see that being an important thing. Well, I look at the, the the headers. We have five headers. Five headers seems okay. There's like supporting statements under that that we can deal with. The return to work, you know, like the, the DBP gonna... puts on the the Office Olympics, for instance. Uh, and I think from a vibrant downtown, I think the fact that everyone's working from home is a long-term consideration and has, again, a huge snowball effect for how many people go out for lunch, how many people do shopping downtown. Um, and so, yeah, and eventually like the collapse of downtown because there's no one there during the day. You know, like, so to me, like the return to work is an important consideration. You know, how much can we actually do about it? Well, we, the Office Olympics is one event for one day a year, but there can be more things that we could actually, that are important to DMC with the daytime being driven by office workers. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think the phrasing is very general. Whereas like, I, I saw a really good example of something the other day that I was like, I was gonna share like, I work at Kiln, it's a co-working space. They negotiated with um, Pizza Alberico, a lunch that Pizza Alberico catered and it was lower cost than if you would go there and they scaled it and like 50 people got a lunch from Pizzeria Alberico and they're doing it every month and it's less than if you would go there. So it saves people money, it helps bring in continuous business for Pizzeria Alberico. It's a win-win, right? Like people get to eat for less, and the business has like recurring stable business, right? Like I, I want to see more like projects, more things like that. I mean, obviously someone took initiative to make that happen, but like specifically addressing potentially like it's too expensive to eat downtown. Like that was a concern we saw. It's a very specific thing that possibly we could do, but to me return to work is like returning to buying things downtown is that like the you know it, it's a little general for me and some of the other things feel a lot more specific which I like um but that's not the only I mean I think that the, the bottom bullets are we we feel very disconnected from those because well I think that's they're yet where, to happen that's where the um steps both long-term and yearly work plan that's, that's they told us those that's right? where those come in to yeah Play. I mean, it's not something that we would talk about every meeting, but yeah, when that time of year comes around. And I'm okay with more general bullet points because you sort of tie yourself, if, if they're very specific, you, you can tend to tie yourself into an initiative for the sake of that. Yeah. Which the one help. thing I could see with return to work working from home is working. So I think maybe it's the working downtown yeah. is maybe yeah. just like the term encourage the return to work downtown yeah. Yeah. or in yeah. the office or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Downtown. Yeah, that would at least help there. Yeah. The strategic partnership thing, is this something that someone else has already have in mind that has in mind? Or was this already? I, I have been talking about this with other there's one other commissioner who I've known for a very long time. And he, so there's two parts to this. Multi-commission meetings. This is one of the reasons I wanted to be chair. So I could be on the every other month meeting to hear from KJ or from UJID and uh, the other one, uh, okay. Boulder Junction. Um, but then I also like know the, the commissioner for the arts commission. 
and that's impacting us what with the art on the garage and so i think that we need more communication uh right now we're all so siloed we don't talk to you we don't know what the other groups are doing and so terry this is kind of um strategic partnerships and the one the second bullet point under long-term investment and planning um connect no Oh, that's a different one. I'm, I was just getting confused. The annual summit with DBP, BID, Council, CU, and other groups. You know, so I view this as two parts. One, I, I invited the board chair of DBP to our uh, retreat. They don't know we exist, and we are both working on the same stuff. And um, I think we should meet with, um, but we can't just do it. Because anytime there's more than three, two of us in a room, it, it, we, we deal with open meeting laws. So we have to have this organized in a way. But I think we should meet with the Downtown Boulder Partnership Board and have meetings with them, work together to enact that five-year vision plan for them to know what we're doing as the city that we have, that we are a liaison that they don't even know exists and that we're the ones getting a third of a million dollars to help <laughs> the ambassadors and they don't even know we exist. And so I see Terry nodding, um, but so I would like to have like meetings with them. I would like to have meetings with like the other commissions, whether it's the arts commission or other thing, transportation. We should talk to transportation sometimes because like, what do they think about Lyme and, and stuff like that? So that's some of my, that's one of my passions is how can we work better versus always having to go through staff? How can we collaborate more? John, I'll just add, that is a great idea. Before Chip left, he was really trying to figure out a way. So we have three different boards of directors. We have three different budgets. <clears throat> They're all interconnected. And in all, the Downtown Boulder Partnership as a whole, we're all working towards the same goals, but the boards are extremely siloed and staff winds up giving the exact same presentation three times a month to three different boards of directors. And then our CEO comes to DMC and does the same thing. And we would absolutely love the opportunity um, to work more collaboratively because we all are working towards the same goals. Um, I, I would love, once Bettina gets here, if we can kind of look at that moving forward, but one suggestion I would have is we're trying to look at how we can consolidate our three boards internally. But until we get to that point, maybe it is <clears throat> a representative from the Downtown Management Commission um, is assigned to each one of our boards. So that way it's one person who's getting an in-depth idea of what each of our boards do. But I think we'll have an overall better understanding of what we're all working towards that way. And that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, there's different ways we can do this. I. I... I don't mean for all of us, all three, to get there, but yeah, you know, we it, we're, we are going as city liaisons. Plugging into pre-existing things, but I, I do have a a premonition that the consultant hired to figure out what's going on with the board is because there's an assessment that it's not working well, that there's too much duplication, not enough recruitment. So I don't know. When you hire consultants, they typically cut stuff, so like or combine or reorg as the former consultants. Um, so I, I guess I'm curious to see what will come out of that because I agree with you, Don. There seems to be a lot of duplication and miscommunication because they're so siloed. And maybe that will come through in the assessment from the consultants about at least the like you did whatever bids one. I mean, to me, it's so obvious they should be combined into one, but like, that's just my opinion. So like <laughs> but the city charter would allow that. Yeah. I, the, I think the city doesn't, from, I, from what I've heard, they don't think that per, the current state is successful. What is, what is the timeline of the consultant work and recommendations? I, I know they staff. finished. What? I guess we know? have to ask staff. And I'm not 100% sure I know they, they just mentioned it in a meeting today, but I don't know what the time frame is. The survey just closed um, last Monday or something like that. So I assume they're yeah, they have they data from the survey. Yeah. And no, they actually met with all the board secretaries yesterday to get okay. some opinions from us, but no definitive. 
So they're still in information right. gathering phase. Mm -hmm. right. They're at the very, because there's three steps are the very first step right now. It's just a gathering. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. And with the new head of DVP, seems like there's not a whole lot that we can do other than what we've already done um, with that joint meeting that we had earlier this year. Continue with that. Yeah, I think I think getting invited to those things, at least in the interim, trying to be more connected yeah. would help. If you could maybe send us the times when those meetings are and we could figure out who's works for what schedule. Or ideally, like we wouldn't come for the whole board meeting. <laughs> we would just be well, one away, Terry comes for all of ours. I I depending on the duration of them and stuff, you know. How long are they, Terry? They're long. Um, yeah. They're at least an hour and a half. Like so, our D and we eat, we meet like on the third Thursday, or we have a very specific cadence. Yeah. Um, so, but this is all good to hear because it should fall in line with by the time Bettina starts and our efforts in really wanting to consolidate things. Um, to have you guys in that group of conversations. Um, we are all for it and we would welcome the opportunity to look how we how we could collaborate the best to make sure that everybody's feeling like we're all working most efficient, efficiently towards all of our goals. Yeah, we should ask Chris, obviously, if it's allowed, because... And Chris does come to two of our three yeah. board meetings, so... And I've come to your meeting, to, to the bid board meeting before. Okay. So I don't think there's any... Because they're public meetings, right? They're public, yep. Oh, the board meetings are public? Okay. I didn't know. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think, yeah, uh, we might need Lisa uh, on our staff here as secretary to help coordinate schedules and meetings and who can get to one. But I think in general, it'd be wise for yeah. one of us to get assigned to each. Like until you guys, until the DBP consolidates your boards, we should probably like take one person takes this one. So, we, and that someone takes this one and someone takes that one. So we're not like always like, being reintroduced to like what's going on and what each one 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 becomes uh, like the, the the liaison to each one and the kind of the same way that we would wish council was here at our meetings at times i think this is a really good first step to consolidating the power of our teams and so too i know that at least with the bid board there is at least one council member in attendance at every one of those meetings yeah there's usually two there at the bid board um i was going to say terry in particular what we like is we want, we don't love to hear about stuff like after they've already been decided and the strategy is confirmed and we're just informed. It's not meaningful to us as a board. We like to be like involved in the strategy or just know about it so that we're like aware early on. Cause I think we find that sometimes we find out about stuff like, oh, that happened. We didn't even know about it. And it more for us, we feel like like we are on this commission representing the businesses or citizens at large in the sure. community. So, you know, we feel like that we have at least a, a meaningful seat at the table of people uh, to say, like, you know, we're trying to speak to what we think would be successful given who we represent. So I think it would be good to not, and to help us, I think it would make it more meaningful for us too, as an aside. Yeah. Oh, no, I totally agree. My yeah. husband used to be the chair yeah. of the bid board. So he would tell me things all the time that came up in their meetings that I had no idea was going on. So definitely. yeah. And then I think we need to build that into our agendas. So as Lisa, when we have our every other month planning meetings, I think we need to have like five, 10 minutes for each of the representatives. Well, you know, again, Terry, you're here, but in a way we need to be able to like circulate that information we found yeah. among our board as, as well, our commission. Yeah. So it doesn't just end up with like one person knows that we need to be able to distribute that knowledge. So I think we need to start building some share time of like what we, you know, sh here's what Terry says, but we are a different commission. We do have a different opinion and a different lens, but we do have a, a similar goals, but we might have like here's what they say but i think we should do it this way kind of approach but it's for them to do but we're just talking to each other yeah. when how often does the boards meet quarterly or no they or meet monthly it's a lot of work so um that's why we're looking at ways that we can consolidate um so tomorrow or this thursday the dbp board meets um 
and that's our advocacy. That's our 501c6. So that's our membership and advocacy arm. The bid board is meeting next Thursday. And we're, that's strictly presentation of the 2024 work plan and proposed budget. Um, the other board is our 501c3, which is our nonprofit. And under that arm is all of our events. Um, so they don't meet until October 2nd. Um, and again, I just want to make sure, like you said, it's a, it's public meetings. I don't, I don't foresee any reason. Yeah, reason. I don't know why you guys haven't been included in the past, but, um, I, I, I can't foresee any reason that we wouldn't welcome you guys to, attend to listen. Yeah. And in a way, I don't know that we need to speak, you know, it's, we're not asking for a seat on your boards. I right. just want to listen, know and, each other. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a right. great idea. And we know again, voting knowing Chip, um, what he had intended to do. He just didn't quite get it done before he left, but this was a direction he wanted to go in to try to break down some of the silos and make sure that we were all working as a bigger community group to get things done. Well, so two things I think need to happen. Terry, can you, do you have like information sheets or can you write a paragraph or anything? Just so we should have five people on our commission right now. We have four. Um, and so I guess I'd like for like just a little bit of information what the three different boards are so that maybe within our group, we can say, oh, I have more interest in this one. I have more interest in this one. Or yeah. that time just works for me. I can never make an 8 a.m. meeting for whatever someone might say. Absolutely. Um, I don't think I have everyone's contact. Don, can I just send it to you for distribution? Oh, yeah. what Why don't you send it to Lisa? It Lisa, should really yep. go through Lisa. Yep, absolutely. We're not allowed Terry, to be all on one thread. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Okay. Each other, so. okay. Yeah. We have all sorts of rules you don't have. Well, I mean, so with city council, it's like they have, it's like the Brady Bunch. They just <laughs> <laughs> they can't. But so if you can talk, if you can coordinate that stuff through Lisa, then she will distribute it to us. Yeah, so absolutely. because it is time and I need to get my kids to my piano lessons, um, if we add Add encourage them to return to work downtown and or return to work in the office. If we put like two words like that at the end of that one, can we move? Would someone want to move approval of our priorities? I would like to approve them once we remove the periods at the end of the bullet points. That really works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're moving to the approval with the, with the exception in the removal of all the periods in the bullet points. And very change good. it all to the same color. Same color font, font oh. size. <laughs> and I think Steffi wanted it all in Comic Sans as well. I get it every time and be like, <laughs> I would second that. Great. Uh, I, I, we are Lisa, moved. Yes. Uh, so I, at least I don't know that we had the appropriate language there, but uh, uh, to, to make it official, uh, I would like to uh, move or does anyone move the approval of the 2023 <laughs> top B and C priorities with those changes of what we just discussed? Yeah, I heard Stephanie. Stephanie. Did. I did, I and I seconded. So I did with yeah. the exception of the period. So yes. That's I was it. just trying to put in an official language. <laughs> Lisa's good at that for us. <laughs> I'll whip something up. <laughs> We're good. Oh, is it yeah. approved? Yeah. Big motion. Motion. Okay. All, all. motion to adjourn. Seconded. We will see you all in November. Right. Thanks, everyone. Really productive. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, I have to go to the people. So, it's <laughs>